Good evening, everyone. My name is Anakshi Sopti, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Asia Society India Center. As always, I'm delighted to see members, patrons, and friends from across the world join us this evening. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Asia Society is a leading educational organization dedicated to building awareness about policy, business, education, and arts from across Asia on a global stage. Inaugurated in 2006 by Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, the India Center has hosted over 800 events, establishing itself as an important forum for the discussion of regional and global affairs. Please do follow our website and social media handles to know more about the awards and other programs from across our 13 global centers. This evening, we focus the spotlight on Afghanistan. As per the recently published US Threat Assessment Report, the Taliban has now emerged stronger than at any point since 2001 when U.S. forces invaded Afghanistan. Post the U.S. withdrawal, it is this security threat that will prove to be the most challenging issue to resolve for the elected government in Kabul. Additionally, this shift in power and talks for regional peace will have long-term impacts on bringing stability in the war-torn country. After the U.S. exit, the onus will lie with regional players like India and Pakistan to strengthen efforts towards building lasting peace in Afghanistan. Neighboring countries like China, Iran and Russia also have high stakes in ensuring the security and economic stability of the country. Our program this evening will discuss all these aspects in detail. We have the honor of hosting a distinguished panel to discuss today's subject. Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay is a senior visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research. As a senior Indian diplomat, he has served in various capacities in Indian embassies and missions in Mexico, Cuba, France, and the United Nations, the Ministry of Defense in India, and eventually as India's ambassador to Syria between 2006 and 2008, to Afghanistan between 2010 and 2013, and Myanmar between 2013 and 2016. As charge the affairs, he also reopened the Indian embassy in Kabul after the dislodgement of the Taliban in November 2001. Ambassador Hussein Haqqani served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States between 2008 and 2011, and is widely credited with managing a difficult partnership during a critical phase in the global war on terrorism. Considered an expert on radical Islamist movements, he's currently director for South and Central Asia at Hudson Institute in Washington, DC. He also co-edits the journal, Current Trends in Islamist Ideology. Vander Felbar Brown is a senior fellow in the Center for Security, Strategy and Technology in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. She's the director of the Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors. She's also the co-director of the Africa Security Initiative and the Brookings series on opioids, the opioid crisis in America, domestic and international dimensions. Rudra Chat Chowdhury, our moderator this evening, is the director of Carnegie India. His primary research focuses on the diplomatic history of South Asia and contemporary security issues. He's the author of the book Forged in Crisis, India and the United States since 1947. He's a senior lecturer at the Department of War Studies and the India Institute at King's College in London. A bit of housekeeping before we proceed. All those who are joining us on Zoom, please leave your questions in the Q&A box. For our audience on Facebook, please drop them in the comment section. And with that, Rudra, over to you. Thanks, Inakshi, and thanks to the Asia Society. It's uh, great doing this. And what a fantastic uh, cast of stars that we have today. Um, I'm, I actually don't have any opening remarks because I don't want to take oxygen away from our expert panel. So I'm going to dive straight into it. I'm also aware of the fact that we've got some fantastic people um, who've joined into this call from different parts of the world. I saw Anand Arni, I saw Marvin Weinbaum, and a range of others. So I'm going to kind of, if you don't mind, I'm going to take the take my privileges and uh, kind of weave you into the discussion as well at some point. But with that, let me just start with uh, Vanda. Vanda, before we get to the region, so to speak, could you just give us a sense of how do you see things unfolding in Afghanistan over the next 12 months up to perhaps the spring of 2022? Great. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Sopti, for the invitation. And I'm delighted to join the conversation with Dr. Chowdhury, Ambassador um, um, 
Hakani and Ambassador Mukhpadahia. Uh, the, 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 Overall, um, we are on the cusp of seeing dramatic changes to the political dispensation in Afghanistan. It is extremely unlikely that <clears throat> the existing uh, Afghan constitution and political arrangements will be preserved, something the United States certainly hoped to accomplish, but essentially failed to do so. How did we get to the point and where are we in the uh, military and political uh, situation in Afghanistan? Militarily, as um, Inakshi stated in her opening remarks, based on US assessments, the Taliban is stronger than it has been at any point since 2001. It is essentially encircled or very close on the cusp, uh, on the threshold, if you would like, of at least 12 provincial cities, uh, provincial capitals. And with the departure of US military forces, it not only has the capacity to pounce on those capitals, but to hold them. That doesn't mean that it can pounce on all of them at the same time, hardly so. Um, but if it is capable of um, launching attacks on two or three simultaneously, perhaps uh, Afghan security forces will be um, severely strained and might not be able to uh, respond adequately. The United States um, uh, is slated to depart Afghanistan by September 11 of this year of 2020. Uh, I should correct that statement, the US military is slated to depart Afghanistan, although there is certainly expectation and hope that US diplomatic, economic and political presence will remain in Afghanistan um, um, in the form of uh, not simply the US embassy, but other assistance vital to the Afghan government. President Biden made this announcement um, uh, in April uh, of this year, uh, something that um, to a large extent, though surprisingly so, shocked the Afghan government. In February 2020, uh, the United States signed a deal with the Taliban that essentially ended, um, uh, that, that provided a pathway for ending US military role in Afghanistan. The deal consisted of two key points. The first point was uh, the Taliban promising to the United States to avoid terrorist attacks against the United States uh, and US partners uh, uh, and to not support terrorist attacks out of Afghanistan territory against the US and US partners. In exchange, the United States agreed to withdraw all of its military forces from Afghanistan by May 1 of this year. The deadline is not met. However, um, the, the, the delay is fairly limited. In fact, although the United States has officially stated that all of its military forces will be out by September 11, the current pace of withdrawal is such that uh, all US forces might be out by um, middle of July. In the original negotiations with the Taliban, there were the hope that two other points would also be vital in the uh, vital elements of the negotiated deal. Namely, that uh, there would be a deal between the Taliban and the Afghan government uh, that would um, uh, bring the Taliban in out of the cold into some sort of power sharing deal, and then there would be a ceasefire. By the time the Doha agreement was signed in February of 2020, those two points became essentially optional as hopes of something that might materialize but um, would not be uh, what the United States would hedge uh, uh, its decisions. And indeed, this has not happened, much to the shock of the Afghan government. Neither the Taliban nor the Afghan government were eager to start negotiations in 2020, both hoping to delay for different reasons. The Taliban, because it wanted to gain other gains, such as the release of Taliban prisoners and gain more military ground. The Afghan government, because it was hoping that with the change of US administration, the US would cancel its withdrawal. That was very unlikely and indeed did not happen. So just very quickly now, uh, uh, why do I say that I believe that the current political dispensation has very small chance of surviving and what is the likely prospect for the immediate next 12 months? The Taliban is very strong militarily, despite having um, uh, faced 20 years of US pressure while the Afghan security forces still suffer from critical deficiencies. Those deficiencies are essentially the same that were there a decade ago. Poor logistics, political um, patronage fragmentation and ethnic fragmentation, weak morale, weak unit leadership, um, lack of specialty enablers, 
and full dependence on outside actors, such as contractors, for the maintenance of all kinds of vital um, enabled capacities, including the Afghan Air Force. So one of the questions now is whether there will be any capacity to provide contractor services. Contractors are also departing Afghanistan through other means directly to the Afghan government and not the US military. The Afghan political class remains deeply fragmented and fractitious. And one of the key developments or key features of the past many years, including the past two years and, and immediate months is uh, very uh, intense negotiations directly between the Taliban and various power brokers to peel them off. In recent, about two, three weeks, we have seen recognition uh, among the Afghan political class that divided the country will fall to the Taliban far more rapidly. And so there are efforts to create uh, something called the National Unity Council to prevent the defection and separate deals. Those negotiations are outgoing and we'll yet to see how much heft uh, they actually have. Critically, however, the Taliban uh, is uh, not simply seeking accommodations and deals that politicians, a strategy that also followed in the 1990s, but is very effective in peeling off Afghan units. This is not a new development. This has been underway for years with many Afghan units not fighting the Taliban, striking separate deal, dispensing weapons after warning the Taliban they were mounting raids. But the speed with which we have come uh, to see this uh, happening in the past few months has been dramatic. So uh, in my view, what we are likely going to, and I should say that the, the political negotiations between the Taliban and the Afghan government through the Doha process, or perhaps a new process eventually, the so-called Istanbul process is moribund. There is really nothing happening meaningfully as of now. My expectation is that we will see at least a year of very tough fighting with the Taliban halting uh, or, or with the Taliban uh, not, not maximizing its military potential until US forces are out. And when they are out in the late summer or fall, first starting to mount serious, um, uh, serious push for provincial capitals. If and how it manages to take so provincial capitals will influence the speed with which Afghan political class will fragment. The one big factor uh, is um, uh, the role of various militias. I would, however, highlight here that the key defining point of the war was the Taliban's capacity to crush the so-called uprisers, militias that emerged against the Taliban around 2012. By 2014, 2015, the Taliban has crushed them, and that was one of the defining moments of the counterinsurgency effort. So unfortunately, my expectation is that we are not going to see any meaningful political negotiations between the Taliban and the Afghan government uh, for at least a year, perhaps a year and a half. And what kind of negotiations then emerge will depend on whether the Afghan uh, security services manage to hold together and resist uh, the takeover of provincial capitals, or at least quite a few of them, and ideally bloody the Taliban's nose. If that doesn't happen, uh, then, in my view, we will see negotiations about very different political order in Afghanistan. And our capacity of external actors really will be, in my view, only to limit the extent of the losses to the current political dispensation and its rights for women, human rights and ethnic minorities um, and not preserve the gain as they exist. Let me uh, hand it over. Back to you. Van, Vanda, thanks so much. So let me turn to Ambassador Hakani. I mean, Vanda made this key point about negotiations. Clearly, negotiations are up in the air. Pakistan plays a central role with regards to the shape that the negotiations will take. You've been a vocal critic of the so called Doha deal of February 2020, and your views aren't well known. Um, so I was just wondering if you could perhaps provide your opening remarks in terms of what role do you see for Pakistan in the next 12 months. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of media speculation about the US and the Pakistani NSA meeting in Geneva. There are reports of how that the Afghan NSA is no longer going to be speaking to his Pakistani counterparts. But, and I did want to put this quote to you um, from Vanda's uh, colleague, Bruce Rydell, whose general views on life, I think, are pretty well known. But in one of the recent pieces, Bruce says, our troops accompanied the top priority in 2011 by killing bin Laden. They cannot defeat the proxy army of the Rawalpindi generals. It is that reality 
that underscores Biden's decision. So I was wondering if you could perhaps frame some of your opening remarks and respond to this as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to begin by uh, comparing uh, what is happening now uh, to what happened in 1989-90 uh, when the Soviets decided to withdraw from Afghanistan. Uh, at that time, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States uh, predicted that the Najib government will fall within two weeks. Uh, the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence, uh, which was then headed by General Hamid Gul, uh, organized a joint Mujahideen attack on the city of Jalalabad, uh, hoping to uh, clinch victory within those two weeks and after that uh, to be able to threaten Kabul. Uh, of course, uh, the Mujahideen got a bloody nose uh, in the battle for Jalalabad. Uh, notwithstanding all the support they had uh, from the American-Pakistani combined at that moment. The Americans lost interest after that, and the rest, as they say, is history. The reason why I repeat this is because we are hearing similar predictions now. A uh, part of them come from the Kabul elite. Uh, the Kabul elite, of course, has an interest in painting a dire picture because quite often they would like foreign patrons to make decisions which they themselves are unable to persuade each other uh, to make. And so a lot of the noise we hear about the Taliban are coming, the Taliban are coming, are no different from the Mujahideen are going to win within two weeks variety. I think that just as the Najib government survived well after uh, the um, uh, departure of Soviet troops, the Afghanistan government too, will hold on because the Afghans have an interest in ensuring that their lives carry on in a manner other than the one that the Taliban are likely to impose. In any case, everybody understands that the Taliban, uh, if they really did control as much of Afghanistan as they say, then their leadership would not have stayed on in Quetta. They would have moved to the areas that they had, quote unquote, liberated. Um, Yes, Afghanistan is complicated. Uh, way back, uh, we saw that uh, all attempts to try and create uh, unity governments of, uh, prior to the fall of the Najib government and then even after were not easy. And the Najib government fell only when the Soviet Union had collapsed and was no longer able to continue to support the government that they had helped create in Kabul. Um, now, with that background, what should we anticipate or be prepared for? First of all, we should be very clear that the United States, of course, is withdrawing militarily, but it is not yet clear whether the United States will completely withdraw, as in not continue to support the government in Afghanistan with at least enough resources to sustain the Afghan military. Second, uh, Pakistan may have had an interest in ensuring that the Taliban remain operational and that there is some challenge uh, to the American created order in Kabul, but they may not necessarily feel the same way about a Taliban victory. Uh, we are hearing different voices from Pakistan. Uh, the Pakistani army chief, uh, more than some of his predecessors, is saying that maybe Pakistan needs to have a different outlook than it has had in the past and not treat everything as a zero sum game in which Pakistan ends up with zero rather than uh, with, uh, with, with everything. So if that is the case, then maybe Pakistan will not go all in in supporting the Taliban as it had done way back uh, when the Taliban eventually took over all of Afghanistan. Lastly, the region's countries all have an interest uh, which does not converge on the subject of the Taliban taking over. Iran has no interest in the Taliban taking over all of Afghanistan. India has no interest in the Taliban taking over Afghanistan and therefore allowing Afghanistan to once again uh, become a safe haven uh, for terrorists who uh, might threaten India. We must remember that the brunt of terrorism emanating from uh, that region has threatened India more than it has threatened uh, the NATO countries um, and uh, the, uh, the the entire uh, withdrawal argument 
is based on the notion that uh, Al Qaeda attacked America on 9 11 and on 9 11 uh, 2021. 20 years later, now that the uh, Al Qaeda threat is gone, therefore the United States no longer needs to be in Afghanistan. But the threat of groups that have operated from Afghanistan uh, are much more real for the neighboring countries and for the region. And I would argue that those threats are also very real for Pakistan. So Pakistan is going through a process of trying to clarify what it can and cannot do. Uh, they have an interest, have always had an interest in the way that they define Pakistan's interest, the Pakistani establishment. They would like to have a government in Kabul that they control and the Taliban are more amenable to their control than other Afghan actors. But even the Taliban are nobody's puppet and will not be anybody's puppet. So in a situation like this, I think there will be many more permutations and combinations than many prognos prognosticators are allowing for. Um, I think that uh, uh, India uh, definitely does not uh, 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 like the idea of a Taliban government or a Taliban dominated government. I think that the Americans will soon learn that uh, the world has moved on uh, much farther than when they got everybody, uh, the Afghan diaspora and uh, uh, political groups together in bond and knocked together a interim government. Uh, there are no, not many takers for the interim government now and it, won't, it will not be as easy as it was 20, 21 years ago. And so what we will see is a slightly different outcome, a more contested outcome than we saw in the 1990s. And with Pakistan not putting all its, uh, 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 going all in on behalf of the Taliban as people have been predicting. Um, I also believe that the Doha process is inherently flawed uh, because, uh, uh, because of the reasons that I have already stated publicly in many, many fora and in many articles. Uh, it was a withdrawal deal. It was not a peace deal. And yet, I would argue that maybe peace will come out in Afghanistan through some more prolongation of the conflict and not through a negotiated process in which nobody is willing to knock heads together. The United States has, does not have leverage with the Taliban. That leverage was squandered in Doha uh, after releasing, getting the Afghans to release all prisoners, after recognizing virtually the Taliban's right to sit across the table with the Afghan government as co-equals. The United States lost its leverage. Pakistan has no leverage on parties other than the Taliban. Uh, the Indians have good leverage with many parties in Afghanistan, except the Taliban. And the Iranians may have leverage with the uh, Shia groups in Afghanistan and perhaps some others who are uh, close to the Iranians. Um, the Russians have been interested primarily in getting the Americans out. They do not really have an interest in a proper peace settlement. So we will see a lot of this speculation but I think that the Afghan government will hold uh, and the Taliban uh, will try to uh, take over as much territory as they can. And Pakistan may not be able to tell the Taliban what to do, but, Taliban will, uh, but, but Pakistan will not like the Taliban to have the free hand that they had in the past and because of which Pakistan got into a lot of trouble Pakistan is struggling to get out of the Financial Action Task Force gray list. It does certainly does not want to be in a blacklist on, on, uh, on the basis of be supporting a Taliban who are butchering Afghans. And the notion that somehow the Taliban have changed is absolutely unrealistic. They haven't. It is very obvious from how they behave in the areas where they do have control as well as what they say publicly. I'm going to stop here. I'm sure that there are going to be a lot of comments and questions based on what I have just said. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Ambassador Hikari. If I turn to Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, sir, if I could ask you, sir, a two-part question is, 
Basit Akani brought up the 1990s, but as almost any book on Afghanistan also makes clear, is that the Najibullah government were, was able to remain a keep a decent ability of stability only as long as financial support from the Soviet Union kept coming in. The minute that stopped at the end of 1991, the regime toppled and civil war broke out. So I was just wondering, is you know, are we back in the 90s or in your view, someone who's tracked Afghanistan longer than most, um, are we looking at a very different kind of dynamic? I mean, there's this game of leverages, um, which everyone's estimating and Ambassador Haqqani outlined so eloquently um, between regional actors, et cetera. But what are you seeing in Afghanistan from your vantage point? That's the first part. And the second part is where, is, where does all of this leave India? Um, sure, India has leverage in Afghanistan. It's worked with various parties in Afghanistan for a very long time. There's high capital investment. But it's also in Afghanistan today where you're hearing reports, as I think Ambassador Haqqani also outlined, where you have groups like the Lashkar Taiba, the Jaish e Mohammed. There are, they seem to be pretty good reports, at least in the press, of camps being set up in some southern parts and eastern parts of Afghanistan. And the key Taliban actor that's going to be still left with a good degree of power and muscle is the Haqqani group. So I was just wondering, how do you see Afghanistan and where does India fit into all of this? Well, thank you very much, Rudra. And uh, let me say, and let me also thank the Asia Society for inviting all of us. It's a, a privilege and pleasure to be with this panel. Um, so, you know, I begin uh, being in the happy position that I could uh, agree with everything that Ambassador Hatani has said and perhaps actually said on my behalf. But uh, let me take your two questions about the difference between the 1990s and now, and where does it leave India? So if we look back at the 1990s, uh, particularly, um, you know, that uh, once the, the Taliban were ousted, there are two major differences that we see that I think we should factor in. The first is that when the, the Taliban came to uh, power, uh, you know, from Pakistan in the 19, mid 1990s, you know, they were seen as a stabilizing force uh, in relation to the intra Mujahideen fighting, led by a pious uh, uh, religious leader. And so there was a certain legitimacy and traction that uh, Mullah Umar brought with it. And I think the Taliban brought with them as a sort of pious religious force that grew up in their mother cells. Uh, that is now totally different. If I understand Afghanistan well, uh, the Taliban are going to be seen as a largely violent terrorist force uh, backed by Pakistan uh, uh, and almost like a proxy of Pakistan. Although, uh, as Ambassador Haqqani said, you know, they have an autonomy of their own. Uh, and the second major difference is that uh, uh, the you know, the, the post-bond dispensation that has lasted 20 years, oddly enough, in the last 40 years of turbulence, uh, it in some measure or the other, you know, reflects a certain stability and progress in spite of externally sponsored terrorism and violence and so on. In those 20 years, what we have seen is a fair amount of human, social and economic development. We have not seen an outflow of refugees. We have, in fact, seen an inflow of expatriates and uh, uh, others who have come back. Uh, all that, of course, may change now. Uh, because once again, we may be back into that position. So you have a situation uh, where, uh, so the big difference I think is that in these 20 years, an entirely new generation has come uh, to life and to age uh, in Afghanistan. And this generation is not non-political. This generation also has its politics. It also has its heroes. It also has its aspirations. And most importantly, you know, it is a generation that is connected to the world. Um, it is not something that, in those 30 years since the Soviet intervention, when uh, Afghanistan, particularly the Taliban years and the Mujahideen years, when uh, uh, Afghanistan was isolated. Along with that, you have a new generation of military officers. A lot of military, you know, we may not see a person of the ability and the command and also the political support that President Najibullah had. Uh, and he collapsed, of course, with uh, the you know, withdrawal of Soviet support, financial support in particular. Uh, but, you know, what we may miss in terms of a kind of a political strongman, uh, we may have, and I think we're going to see this, it's not going to be perhaps a single figure, but we may see pockets of resistance, new leaders coming up. I know the Taliban has taken great trouble to ensure that all potential rallying points, political rallying points uh, have been eliminated over these last many years. Uh, but I don't think we should exclude the possibility that uh, the new generation will get together behind a new generation of leaders. Uh, uh, the pa old power brokers will continue to be important. Many of them uh, will, uh, you know, as Ambassador Haqqani said also, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, that in the National Unity Council, or perhaps it was Banda who said that, 
uh, may get together. I think one of the strategies that the US has adopted in the Biden uh, formula has been to shake up uh, the Afghans and the region uh, to realize that, all right, the Americans are going, now you have to sort out your problems uh, yourself. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that factor could also play a role. Having said that, I think the overall, I have to say that, um, you know, we uh, are definitely entering a period of great instability. Uh, uh, everything is open. We do not know exactly what is going to happen. As far as India is concerned, uh, you know, I think one of the things that India has been able to do over the last 20 years is actually create the kind of equities uh, that are there in the public, uh, in the public sphere. Uh, as one uh, Afghan leader told me that, um, you know, Afghanistan is now, uh, India is now in the hearts of Afghans. So uh, however much uh, India's role could be limited, uh, not so much by the Taliban, because I think the Taliban also have an interest in uh, having a relationship with India for historical reasons, also for religious reasons. Uh, you know, the Deoband, um, uh, the Deoband in India still has a religious meaning for them as well. Uh, but apart from that, just the sheer fact of the economic weight, the market of India, um, you know, medical treatment in India, there are many factors which will attract people. Uh, also, just popular support for India. All, all that will remain. And however much the Pakistanis may try to limit India's role, I don't think they will succeed uh, entirely. Uh, in 20 years, Afghanistan has changed. And I think there are new relationships and a new generation that will forge uh, a, a new kind of path. And this path may be unstable. It may be uh, even bloody. And it's too early to say right now uh, what uh, India would do. But I think India is not too worried about the Taliban coming as part of a power sharing agreement. Uh, India would be worried about Taliban taking over power and the kind of uh, support that uh, you know terrorist groups might get uh, within such a dispensation, notwithstanding what they say. Uh, but um, you know, uh, um, uh, India also has equities with the new generation, and in the new uh, chapter. I think uh, India's interests will lie with the new generation. Thank you, sir. If I could just follow up with one question before I come back to the panelists. Um, in the near future, are you saying is that India would be, if not sanguine, but just be forced to be content with some part of the Taliban sitting inside the Afghan parliament, if that were to be the case? See, I think um, every country will have a plan A, B, and C. Uh, let's say the good case scenario that there is actually a power sharing agreement. Um, uh, you know, I think that is a good uh, um, scenario for India because you'll be dealing with a single Afghanistan, not a divided Afghanistan, hopefully not a, an Afghanistan divided uh, uh, within itself. And to the extent that, you know, I, uh, IS will continue, there will be terrorism, Pakistan, uh, ISI may continue its activities. Uh, at least we have a government and we will have entities in the government to, to be able to, uh, to, 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 to work with. But, uh, you know, plan A may not be the plan that uh, the, the scene on the ground. And again, I think it would be premature to say that. But um, as again, uh, Ambassador Khani said, you know, we know that uh, Iran has a different view on the Taliban. We know that Russia has publicly said that they will not countenance uh, uh, an emirate. Uh, we know that most of the region is not united on the emirate. We also know that uh, uh, Pakistan has some uh, uh, concerns about a Taliban takeover and uh, not sharing power and also its possible impact in the Pashtun areas uh, in uh, Pakistan, particularly through the TTP, uh, quite apart from its relations with the United States and so on. So we'll have a different game. We also have back channel uh, talks with Pakistan, as you're aware, and General Badwa has actually talked about peace in all directions. So I think we will explore all opportunities for peace uh, before we look for uh, other kinds of alliances. Okay, thank you. I'm going to come back to um, both the ambassadors on India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan in a minute. But if I can just turn back to Vanda. Vanda, you've got the range of questions. And actually, the first six or seven all have to do with China, which squarely falls in your area of expertise from Rangaraj and Pushpendra, Madhukar, and someone called Galaxy J6. I'm guessing that's a mobile phone. Um, but the basic question is, how do you read the role of China? And I guess here there's an exception, which is China wasn't around in the 1990s in Afghanistan in the way it is today. So how does China shape 
the, um, the near future of Afghanistan from your point of view? And then I've got a couple of more kind of detailed questions on the US withdrawal and what to expect. And before I take it back to the ambassadors, Vanda. Uh, sure. Um, so China, of course, in the 1990s opposed the Taliban and was one of the actors that um, supported the Northern Alliance. Um, against the Taliban, but at the same time as the 1990s uh, progressed and the Taliban achieved greater and greater power and the Northern Alliance held on to very small territory against the Taliban, China also started having its dialogues with the Taliban back then. And for the past decade, China has um, been very active in reaching out to the Taliban. It has frequently hosted Taliban negotiations and, and uh, Taliban delegations rather than participated in various negotiations and stimulated negotiations with the Taliban. Um, at the same time, China has uh, have economic interests in Afghanistan. Uh, there is frequently hope in Afghanistan that those economic interests related to CPEG, related to uh, debris uh, will uh, make China uh, act very robustly in Afghanistan and prevent um, uh, a Taliban takeover. There is, for example, lots of speculation in Afghanistan about China coming in in a role that essentially replaces the United States. I, I think those speculations are very unlikely to materialize. Uh, in fact, despite the fact that China invested uh, in Afghanistan in the sense of bidding and preempting a lot of contracts, it um, uh, in fact invested very little in any kind of um, physical um, structures, extraction. It, it bid on the contracts, won the contract, and then ended up doing nothing because of the insecurity. And many of those contracts are a decade old now. And we have seen really any uptick uh, in China's economic activity. And meanwhile, um, while I'll agree with the conversation that none of the regional actors, perhaps uh, in, I would say also including uh, Pakistan, do not prefer to see an emirate. All the regional actors, including China, Russia, and Iran have made their own peace with the Taliban. They all prefer a power sharing um, deal in which the Taliban is constrained and certainly in which the Taliban brings in ethnic minorities. And I would posit that to the extent that the future government in which the Taliban is the strongest actor, in my view, very likely government, uh, seeks to exclude um, ethnic minorities, it will be inherently unstable. Uh, but nonetheless, while those are sort of common shared preferences across the region, Russia, China, and um, uh, Iran um, have made their own arrangements. Uh, they support the Russia and China have supported the Taliban with weapons and intelligence. Uh, both countries at the same time also cultivate a variety of proxy militias and power brokers. Russia has been for a good number of years cultivating uh, militia forces in northern, uh, 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 northern Afghanistan, going back to its own strategy. And uh, Iran has, um, of course, um, uh, special relations with the Shia population. And <clears throat> that is also the issue of the Raj Fatimayum force uh, that uh, uh, Iran recruited from Afghanistan to go fight uh, in Syria. And that is now uh, either partially back uh, in Afghanistan or can be injected. So I would say that all those countries, uh, China doesn't have its own militias, but China has actively exported, uh, explored uh, the possibility of opening a military base in, uh, in Barakshan. We'll also add on China here um, that in addition to economic interest, uh, China's most important interest in Afghanistan is counterterrorism interest. It's in a very much actually the same position that the United States. And there, um, China has uh, essentially secured similar um, promises, similar arrangements from the Taliban and the US that the Taliban promising not to allow Uyghurs, Uyghur militants to use Afghanistan for attacks in China and support for um, uh, Uyghur Muslims that are brutalized in Xinjiang. Um, there are Uyghur fighters, uh, Taliban has not acted against them, but the promise is similar to the promise with the US. They will not be allowed to act uh, outside of um, the country. So my broad uh, suggestion here is that any notion that we will either have enough regional unity and more important regional leverage for the region to become the Tom Sawyer after the United States failed to um, defeat the Taliban, the, the Tom Sawyer solution, the region will come in and hold uh, and prevent uh, the rise of Taliban ascendance 
it's coming to power, power sharing power, but nonetheless, it's coming to power uh, and, um, and, 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 and preserve the existing political dispensation, the existing constitutions and elections and rights as they exist is in my view very unlikely. Thanks, Wanda. There's a, there's a question specifically on CPEC and Chinese economic interests inside of Afghanistan. And I was wondering if you've got a very quick response to sort of the future of CPEC or the future of the BRI across Afghanistan. How central is that to Chinese calculations? I'm guessing it is, but in what way? Well, I, you know, I think China's preference is to be both able to use Afghanistan as a crucial connectivity uh, uh, junction, as a, as, a, as a crossroads with, with infrastructure being built to be able to move goods from Central Asia into China across the region. And of course, there is also the promise of the uh, uh, minerals, presumably one trillion dollars worth of them underneath the Afghan dust. I would, however, posit that while those are positive objectives, they are not the linchpin of China's strategy. In fact, all behavior of China in terms of investment indicates that while it would like to be able to eventually exploit them, it is under no illusions that either the connectivity infrastructure nor those minerals are accessible and will be accessible. So it's a nice benefit if we could ever get to the point. The Taliban has been actively telling China that Chinese economic interest will be preserved, that the Taliban... Uh, very much wants uh, economic investment. It's one big difference uh, among the differences listed from what the Taliban is today compared to the 1990s. In the 1990s, the Taliban uh, sought to purify the country by destroying all economic and administrative structures uh, up to that point, to bring the country back to as a backward administrative version as possible. Uh, that's not the Taliban of today. They, they are not democracy supporters. They don't want elections. They do not believe in women's rights or human rights. They want a religious authoritarian rule, but with economic investment and preservation of economic gains. And they are giving the same message to China, to the United States. We will preserve your economic investments. We want them, the more the merrier. So if I can just turn to Ambassador Hakani, just two quick questions of, from where Vanda left off is, potentially the role of China. I mean, do you see that generally? Are you sanguine with the view that it provides the role of a stabilizer in a sense? It's got its own interests and it's got its own equities inside of Afghanistan. Um, the last thing it would want is a high degree of instability or even civil war. So I was just wondering, how does that play out when it comes to sort of Pakistan and the near future of Afghanistan? And a second and a more prosaic question, which is kind of stepping outside of the of, of, of Pakistan and the region is, um, how does this work in terms of providing assistance to Afghanistan in the near future? So the U US officials have come out clearly now and said this, that humanitarian support will be provided, economic support will be provided, which you outlined in your opening remarks. But in terms of military support to Afghanistan, I was wondering if you had any insights. Um, how, do, how does air support work, for instance, in the near future? inside of Afghanistan? Where are those drones going to take off? What is the CT support going to look like? Do an ANDSF, which looks pretty robust today, but as we know from history, could crumble in six to eight months. Um, so I just wanted to, I was just wondering if, if you had any views on both these points. If the question is directed at me, I try not to get into this business of uh, this will happen or that will happen for one very simple reason. Afghanistan and that region is not always uh, predictable by uh, what I call very Western standards. Uh, the reason why I began by talking about how the CIA's prediction of uh, the Najib government collapsing in two weeks uh, was wrong. The reason why I started with it was to try and point out that it's a complicated and different picture on ground. Uh, the Pakistani Pashtun population has a lot of overlap with Afghanistan. Uh, there is a virtual sort of a, a border that is not a hard border. Uh, a lot happens that is not necessarily controlled by either state. Uh, and so therefore, uh, these uh, uh, sort of, uh, just because uh, there has been consistent Western involvement for about 30 years, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the society and its various uh, operations uh, start conforming uh, to the patterns of uh, uh, 
states as we know them in the West. So uh, there will be some kind of a uh, internal Afghan compromise that will emerge. Uh, uh, there are uh, real issues uh, among various Afghan parties, but uh, some of them will decide that it is more important to keep the Taliban from gaining control than to pursue their own internal uh, disagreements. Uh, the very fact that uh, outside governments are involved gives some of the actors leverage. They think that, you know, we have uh, a, a, a somebody that we can go to to try and try and resolve our internal disputes and issues. So therefore, it looks much bigger, the problem looks much bigger than it would once the outside actors are actually not exercising the kind of influence that people are used to. Um, so that's one part of the answer uh, to your question. Um, as far as, uh, look, uh, the NDS is in a much better place today uh, than the Northern Alliance's intelligence was uh, in the 1990s, and they hung in there, they fought. Why is this assumption that there will be people in Afghanistan who will just roll over and play dead uh, because the Americans are leaving? Uh, the Americans came and that was good and people liked it. Uh, with the Americans came lots of contractors and people said, okay, fine, they're, 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 they're welcome too. Then there was the whole uh, uh, NGO crowd and they all came in and people said, ah, okay, there's, there's, there's an economy that they are generating. But then there is an Afghanistan that's been there for centuries, which does not have this kind of economy and this kind of complex uh, 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 sort of a means of sustaining themselves. And people adjust very quickly. Second point, uh, as far as the uh, question of the Taliban wanting economic assistance, I personally don't see too much of Western assistance going to the Taliban, even after some kind of a superficial settlement. And the reason is, is very simple. Uh, if you see what the Taliban are saying consistently, uh, they espouse a certain ideology. That ideology will have manifestations which certain other people will not like. And so I do not see the American Congress passing large amounts of money for uh, uh, for 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 an Afghanistan uh, for a Taliban led led Afghanistan and Ch Pakistan does not have that kind of money. China may want to support, but again, as uh, uh, Wanda very rightly pointed out, um, China will not get the kind of economic returns that some people say they'll get. So, question is, there is a lot of talk about a lot of things that may not pan out. Uh, in as as things start unfolding. Sure, I take that point, but I mean, clearly it's the job of analysts to try and look at the hypotheticals and then work backwards. I mean, I, it reminds me of this book by Artemi Kalinowski called The Long Goodbye. And just to use your ex exact example, what Artemi makes clear there is that the Soviet Politburo asked exactly the same question. They said, listen, Najibullah is not going to just disappear. And then boom, one day he was gone. So, I mean, I think the estimations work on both sides. It was gone right? with all due respect because the Soviet Union was gone. Uh, so it wasn't a collapse of the Soviet Union. Right. So if you are predicting or somebody is predicting that the United States and the European Union are going to collapse in the next few years and that will result in the Taliban takeover, by all means. No, and I don't think that's the... Sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, I don't think that's the argument. I think the... So the question I had about Sarkhani was just... I think it's it's a I mean it's it seems like a sensible argument for most people to say is that look Afghanistan's going to be in some degree of trouble in the near future is a stable force stable investments a large military force is going to evaporate from that country it's going to lead to a degree of instability and I think there is there is a good amount of um, analysis in terms of what is the kind of military support that will be directly provided to Afghanistan and you know sitting where we are in the immediate the question was more in terms of do you see the Biden administration being able to provide some kind of direct or indirect military support in the near future to support the NDS, the SF, to provide counterterrorism, air support, etc.? I, I think I think these things have not yet been thought through. I think okay. that the decision to withdraw was a political decision. It was a political decision for the Trump administration. It is a political decision for the Biden administration. Political support for uh, military presence in Afghanistan uh, diminished. 
and as it diminished, both successive presidents wanted to get out. Uh, will they continue to support uh, a government in Afghanistan? Uh, there's a question mark over it. What will be the extent of that support? Um, look, the Afghans will have to adjust to a period of low external assistance. And I think that they've already been working on it. Some will adjust more quickly than others. Uh, but uh, very frankly, I am not in the corner where, uh, uh, look, there was a war in Afghanistan before the Americans came. Sure. And there will be a situation in Afghanistan after the Americans leave. Just because the Americans were there for 30 years, I agree with you, big presence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Afghanistan's internal uh, issues, Afghanistan's issues with Pakistan, Pakistan and India issues reflecting on Afghanistan, these are realities that go farther back in history than just these last few years. And so therefore, I think that the um, what we should be looking at is, can the United States continue to help stabilize Afghanistan even after withdrawing its troops. And I think it can by helping the Afghan government uh, with uh, a commitment uh, of sufficient resources to keep the Afghan national uh, security forces uh, a significant presence uh, by providing some kind of air cover and air force to the Afghan government, which wasn't provided originally because there were concerns about its impact on uh, the regional balance of power. Uh, will India step up and go beyond its traditional pattern of uh, providing only non-military assistance and actually start providing significant military assistance? I think it was Ambassador uh, Mukhopadhyay who said uh, not long ago that there was a time when there was a Indian military presence in Afghanistan. Uh, could that come uh, come to uh, come back? We do not know. My point is that this is a hasty withdrawal decision. It will throw Afghanistan into turmoil, but that turmoil is not going to end in two weeks, two months, or even two years. Okay, thank you, sir. Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, I was just wondering if you could, you know, shed some light on the role of India and Pakistan in Afghanistan today. Now, there's obviously uh, there's a changing dynamic. It, it would seem to India-Pakistan relations, at least at some very minimal level. The reach out, the back channel, the reaffirmation of a ceasefire phone call of 2003, and so on and so forth. Seems that at least both sides are talking. There's a connection, for instance. Um, do you see that bilateral connection also having a stabilizing effect on Afghanistan, or is it just too soon, or is this kind of misplaced analysis? So you're, you're on mute. Okay, uh, thank you, Rudra. And I, I also uh, thank you to the other panelists for some very, very interesting points. Um, so, you know, may I also take this opportunity to address uh, the question that you have posed, uh, but also sort of go back a little into some of the other problems. So I think, you know, look, uh, this is a moment, it's an opportunity. I think both sides are exploring, but we have also seen uh, al almost immediately some structural limits uh, to the extent of cooperation that is possible. Uh, even in an instance like trade, and uh, you know commodities that Pakistan wanted to import from India for its own economy and its own interest, uh, you know there were structural impediments that actually prevented it from happening. So good intentions are not really good enough. There are sort of very deep structural and mindset issues at work here. But uh, let me just go back to I think two three points. I think uh, one is you know look let's see the entire Biden approach. You know talks about bringing up uh, the principal power brokers uh, inside uh, Afghanistan together to cash out a deal rather than leave it to a kind of formal, slow, halting, tortuous process in Doha. Uh, again, basically motivated by a hurry, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, find, you know, have a fig leaf of a, of a settlement and be able to leave uh, uh, Afghanistan. So, uh, but what it does is it has an internal process, it has a regional process, and it has the UN facilitating uh, all these processes. But the one country that we know who's a spoiler in the game simply does not find mention uh, in the entire Biden strategy, and that is Pakistan. Uh, and, you know, in fact, it is not just other than the Afghans, other, you know, it's best reflected in, I think, what Mohib said, other than the Afghans, almost everybody else is, you know, basically, uh, 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 basically stepping on eggs on the question of Pakistan. And there is no solution to the problems inside uh, uh, Afghanistan without, without somehow having restraints on, uh, on Pakistan. Now, this has been known all along, 
I mean, President Bush sent Armitage to convey a message. Uh, uh, you know, President o Obama analyzed the problem in Afghanistan as and in Iraq and Afghanistan, saying Iraq was a war of discretion, Afghanistan was a war of choice. In Afghanistan, the theater of the war was in uh, uh, Afghanistan, but the locus really lay in Pakistan and therefore created this AFPAC strategy. And then you had President Bush coming out with his uh, South Asia strategy, again, clearly identifying Pakistan as the source of the problem. But having identified the all three administrations, having identified this problem, they have simply not been able to uh, uh, make any progress. Secondly, on the question of, uh, you know, external kind of dynamics, I think one of the things that we are missing is that the entire balance of power will in the region uh, will shift with the US withdrawal. And I actually really wonder if the United States has really thought through this. On the one hand, you know, you have a kind of containment strategy for China predicated in the Indo-Pacific. On the other hand, the US will be actually ceding space uh, uh, in the perhaps the weakest underbelly of uh, China in, Af in Afghanistan, very close to Xinjiang. And it, with the US withdrawal, uh, even if it's political support and economic support and financial support, which by the way, I have some doubts. Once the situation uh, crumbles or if it gets worse, there will be a temptation of you know, just washing your hands off and saying this money is going down the drain, unless two things happen. One is that, of course, there is another terrorist act which makes the, uh, the United States uh, pay interest uh, to Afghanistan once again, or the geopolitics of it that I was talking about. The present geopolitics is that two countries that the US is at odds with, uh, Russia and China, will be the major beneficiaries of the US withdrawal. Add to that China's geoeconomic strategy with Iran, uh, uh, as well as you know uh, Iran's own interests there. Uh, so basically, and, and Pakistan. So basically, you have uh, potentially uh, Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan on one side, and the new generation of Afghanistan, India, Europe, and the United States on the other side. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, really, at some point, I think these things will come to uh, to to uh, to you know uh, affect the calculations. Right now, it hasn't happened. And what we have seen from the Biden strategy really seems to suggest that, you know, the priorities are COVID, uh, counterterrorism worldwide, not just in Afghanistan, uh, which requires a different strategy, and China. And Afghanistan is losing focus. So my real worry is, in spite of their sort of assurances right now, which, by the way, if you read uh, uh, President, Trump, uh, President Biden's speech, they're quite tepid whether it is support to the ANDSF or it's support to women and minorities or democracy, there's virtually no mention of democracy, there's no mention of Pakistan, uh, is actually really quite tepid. So there is a real risk that unless something to the contrary happens, uh, it will be, you know, uh, in 1989, once again, US loss of interest, a vacuum in uh, Afghanistan, in which all kinds of people will step in. This time, it's not just the Taliban, it's the IS and God knows what other features Waiting on the uh, sidelines. Thanks, sir. That's it, Mukhopadhyay. So, Van, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to put an optimistic spin on this given the realities on the ground, but you wanted to come back to some of the points on the kind of military support that might be available to Afghanistan in the near future. Yes, um, um, thank you. Uh, so, you know, right now there is certainly very strong bipartisan support um, for continuing the funding of the Afghan uh, National Security Forces. And should that funding evaporate, the funding collapse. So I think there is enough awareness of the dynamic. The question is uh, how, how that funding will be sustained if and when we see significant fragmentation of the forces. The forces are fragmented. They were never unified. They are making deals with the Taliban, uh, but still at relatively low unit level. If we start seeing uh, much, much uh, 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 larger accommodation to the Taliban and surrender to the Taliban, it might be that U.S. Um, funding more exclusively shifts, for example, to war Afghan security forces. I think there are also issues of how uh, together um, uh, the uh, and NDS, the intelligence service of Afghanistan, will hold, and there are significant changes in some of the power remaining within the um, within the various fragments within the various factions of NDS. Uh, so that th they are itself indicative of the dramatic um, changes in the balancing of power internally that are underway um, in Afghanistan. 
There is also exploration that the United States, that, 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 are, that I would say that is more than that, there are hopes and expectations that the United States will continue providing remote advising to at least some members of the Afghan forces, particularly special operations forces, such as flying them out to training in the Middle East um, or perhaps uh, elsewhere and exploration of how to switch contractor support, such as maintenance of the Afghan Air Force, to um, uh, be directly contracted through the Afghan government. That's challenging, including because repeatedly, as late as March of this year, the Afghan government has tried to apply taxes on US contractors that the US government has not recognized. Uh, that's been longstanding view of the Afghan government, this is legitimate and longstanding view of the uh, US government uh, that this is a bribery extortion scheme on the part of uh, the Afghan government. So you know, I, it's kind of important to emphasize that as late as in a moment where the whole country is truly on the precipice, uh, pressures for patronage and corruption ride high and continue to trump uh, national state making. I think there is no chance and, and I want to repeat that, that the United States would in any way continue to provide direct air support to the Afghan government. This is simply not going to happen. Hmm. Uh, and it has been US air support that has um, wrestled uh, uh, provincial capitals taken over from the Taliban. So that's one reason why we are likely going to see significant Taliban push on provincial capitals and ability to hold them. And I would like to add one uh, other comment on the strategic dimensions in response to uh, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay's um, strategic picture. You know, I would posit that there is um, significant awareness uh, in the United States and perhaps even in the U.S. government that U.S. withdrawal is ceding uh, uh, space to Russia and China. I would say there is also hope that, uh, you, uh, that Russia, China, the region, uh, could come together and um, help preserve or help, help reduce the extent of losses. Um, but uh, I think, however, there is also um, uh, uh, the, the core of the analysis lies is that Afghanistan is simply not strategically important. And as Ambassador Mukhopadhyay spoke about, that the real fulcrum of power is in the, in the Pacific. And um, this is something that has been difficult for Afghan politicians uh, since President Karzai. Many believe that Afghanistan is the center of the new great game. And that's why they held the belief until March of this year, until April, that the U.S. would simply not pull its military forces. Um, whereas the U.S. understanding is that Pakistan is far more important than Afghanistan and more, far more important than that. Uh, the Indo-Pacific, India, U.S. relations with India, what's happening um, uh, in that space is far more important than anything happening uh, in Afghanistan. And so, yes, uh, the U.S. is liquidating its extensive commitments to that region and moving toward normalization uh, of relations based on uh, really not uh, based on a judgment that Afghanistan is not a strategic priority. Yeah, I think that's a good uh point to segue to perhaps closing remarks with, and we've got a range of questions, which I'm going to club into one big one. And if I could ask all the panelists to perhaps give their views and any other thoughts that you might have as we wrap up in about, say, three to three and a half minutes each. We've got a question from Mudit from Ambassador KV Rajan and a question from Ravi Velour. And I'm going to put it together in this way is the last 20, 30 years was about South Asia and Afghanistan. Um, the next 20 and 30 years are going to be likely going to be about quote unquote the Indo Pacific. Um, that's certainly the kind of pivot in action that you see today, for instance. Um, if you agree with this general statement and the details aside, is how do you see the Biden administration approaching South Asia more broadly? Um, so, post withdrawal American policy on South Asia, for instance. Does that have, uh, does that change? Does that have a big effect, for instance? So are we just gonna see a lot more of Pakistan dealing with counterterrorism, India being more central to the Quad and the Indo-Pacific and basically the verve of that kind of argumentation moving eastwards. Um, and alongside that, perhaps if, if I could also kind of sneak in one question is, there's, and as Vanda brought up, is that as the Biden administration exit, there seems to be this estimation that the region or local powers will step in, Russia and China, 
I think there's a good question from Ravi here is to say is how much coordination is happening at the moment between, say, Russia and China when it comes to the future of Afghanistan? So first question, broad one, Biden, the withdrawal, where does this leave South Asia as far as U.S. foreign policy is concerned? The second question, how much actual coordination is there among regional and neighboring powers when it comes to the future of Afghanistan? So perhaps I could start with Ambassador Haqqani, if that's OK, and move the other way around to Ambassador Mukhopadhyay and finish up with Vanda. Ambassador Haqqani. Thank you very much. I'll just give a very quick answer uh, uh, to the first uh, question. Let me just begin by saying that uh, Afghanistan, uh, as the centerpiece of US uh, South Asia policy was not by design. Uh, it was the consequence of a single single day, 9-11. Um, now, Indo-Pacific policy is a grand strategy. So the two are not comparable. One is a grand strategy that is by design, and that's a long-term plan, uh, and, and it will probably continue. As far as the Afghanistan piece is concerned, because it was a response to a, to, to a single event, I would argue that another single event could determine uh, policy uh, in that direction once again. Uh, and that, that single event could be something internal, uh, for example, in Pakistan. Uh, it could be something uh, that happens in relation to Afghanistan. And it could also be uh, a new round of uh, terrorism emanating from that region. Um, it's going to be an uncomfortable situation for the U.S. There are people who realize that. That is why President Biden wants to continue to have so-called uh, counterterrorism presence. All the how you will have counterterrorism uh, presence is something that nobody is sure about. They're talking to Pakistan again, but I don't think that the good old days of drone bases inside Pakistan are going to uh, return. Uh, long distance drone management is not going to have the same effect. So, so we do not know. As I said, uh, we do know what we don't know, to use a, um, uh, a Rumsfeldian kind of expression. As far as the Russian and Chinese collaboration, I would let Ambassador uh, Mukhopadhyay address that uh, more. But let me just say one thing, that Russia's interest this time around in Afghanistan was not a positive interest, it was a negative interest. It was more about getting the Americans out and as kind of payback. Uh, otherwise, I don't think that Russia has the kind of specific interests in Afghanistan that it may have had in the old Soviet era. Do the Central Asian republics have some interest? Yes. Uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan have particular interests because they do not want anything emanating from Afghanistan uh, overflowing into them. And spill, they, everybody wants to avoid the spillover. China's interest is going to be, as I think uh, Mr. Rana Banerjee has said in the chat, uh, that China's interest is going to be uh, basically much more tied to Pakistan than, uh, than any other powers for the simple reason that China has bet heavily on Pakistan anyway. China is deeply invested in Pakistan. Pakistan and China are working together on a number of things. And the Chinese understand that Pakistan knows a lot more about Afghanistan and has a greater presence there than China is likely to have in the near future. So they will work together with Pakistan, even when they do not completely agree with Pakistan and have their own fears about uh, spillover into Xinjiang. Thank you, sir. Ambassador Thank you. I, I agree with uh, Ambassador Hakani both on the point of single incident and grand strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Afghanistan and Indo-Pacific, uh, as well as in the Russian interest and also the Chinese interest. Uh, I will add uh, by sort of saying that at this point, I think uh, China and Pakistan are really hoping to piggyback on each other. Uh, uh, Pakistan will provide the entry to China to be able to you know, uh, uh, and, and in fact, Pakistan is offering this entire geo-economic plank, uh, not, uh, uh, you know, in terms of geo-economics of its own, but really on behalf of China and the BRI. And if you see China also, uh, you know, there is a speculative, but I think one could see, for example, in the thrust towards Ladakh, I think some issues coming up in the Wakhan corridor, as well as uh, uh, questioning some of the boundary agreements with Tajik Tajikistan, see that sort of long-term deal, 25-year-old, deal with Iran that, you know, while China may feel the pressure, 
in the Indo-Pacific, it may also be looking for an outlet uh, from that pressure towards the West as part of a much larger uh, kind of Asia uh, and Gulf strategy. Uh, so, you know, we, uh, you know, one could look at, for example, what happened in Ladakh in the month. It's, it's speculative, admittedly, but in terms of this kind of westward thrust across the Pamirs, across the Hindu Kush, uh, you know, uh, down the CPC through uh, 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 through uh, uh, Afghanistan, offering Taliban the bait that there will be investments, which Taliban, of course, wants, uh, the bait of, you know, uh, China's immense, uh, sorry, Afghanistan's immense uh, mineral potential. But I would also add one thing. I think China should be careful uh, that somewhere deep down in the American strategy, and I think some people have talked about this, uh, that the United States may also be wishing to lure China into a second generation bear trap in Afghanistan. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, you know, the Xinjiang problem is there. Uh, actually, there was a very interesting statistic sometime back about uh, prisoners uh, captured by the ANDSF, uh, IS, IS prisoners. The largest number outside uh, uh, Pakistan I think the Pakistani numbers were in the range of 299 out of a total of 400 something. But the second largest number, much smaller uh, in the range of 30s, was from China. Uh, so, you know, China does have to be worried about the ripple effects of Xinjiang uh, in Afghanistan, particularly if we have a, a, a kind of more fundamentalist, uh, uh, you know, outfit there. Because ultimately, you know, they are birds of the same feather and they react uh, to the same uh, pain. Thanks, uh, Basidam Kupadai. Um, I can already see the range of analysts trying to now compute the trade-off between China and West Asia and the Indo-Pacific. Um, that, that's really helpful. It's given us a lot to think about. Um, Vanda. Well, um, um, thank you very much. I think a lot of the ground has been covered. You know, I would emphasize that the core of uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy and basic grand strategy for the United States is orientation to India and Southeast and Northeast Asia, Australia, that space. It is not um, um, in the landlocked center of um, uh, Central Asia and in Afghanistan. So that's clearly what is emanating uh, the Biden uh, administration and what to a very large extent was emanating uh, the Obama administration that felt um, trapped and was really only a reluctant buyer of expanding US military presence and the surge. And indeed, it's also to what a large extent emanated even uh, the Trump administration with uh, President Trump announcing the Southeast Asia strategy. He did not believe for a minute, feeling that he was uh, pushed into it by uh, the Pentagon and then seeking to liquidate. As far, so there's been long bipartisan support for very significant diminishment of US um, presence and role uh, in uh, Afghanistan, a role that at its core always was about narrow counterterrorism gains, even as a uh, narrow counterterrorism um, focus, even as other issues such as gains later on became enrolled into the strategy. And um, the issues of, you know, will, um, uh, a new terrorist attack uh, on some international target, perhaps U.S. embassy, bring the U.S. back. I hear that frequently from uh, Afghan people as a hope that the U.S. could come back under those circumstances. Well, you know, perhaps um, I would, however, say that uh, such attacks can be faced in very many other parts of the world. And in fact, what's been very interesting about the Biden administration uh, counterterrorism posture is uh, the extent that the, to which it is focusing on brand new spaces in Africa, as well as some established spaces in Africa. So there is clearly an understanding that um, US role, uh, US counterterrorism strategy cannot uh, be essentially based continually on dedicating such extensive assets to one space when the terrorism threat is much more diffused. And in fact, attacks on say US, uh, um, uh, US asset. Uh, could very likely come um, from elsewhere. Let me leave it there and just thank uh, you, Rudra, for the excellent conversation, all the questions that came, and uh, to my uh, colleagues on the panel for a fascinating discussion. Thanks, uh, Vanda, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, and Ambassador Hakani. And perhaps if I could perhaps uh, ask the organizers, it might be quite useful to do this with uh, this fantastic group of experts one year down the line and try and test some of the hypotheses that have been put forward. 
Um, I think it would be a certainly kind of a worthwhile exercise. And one can only hope, and I'll end with an optimistic spin, is that one can only hope that it's stability that one way or the other in whichever avenue and however you interpret it works out in Afghanistan for the high human cost that the country is paying for 20, 30, 40 years of intervention. So with that, um, thank you so very much, Ambassador Hakani, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, Van of Alpa Brown, and the Asia Society for having us. And thank you for our great participants and for the super questions. Goodbye.